Well, it is great to see everyone today. It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord and uh, a very special blessing for those of you who were here yesterday. Um, I, uh, I appreciated your faithfulness to come and to support the Hart family. And I still see uh, Miss Willa and some of the family here, Ed's niece. And so we're glad to have you all with us as well. Um, you know, Last week, we started a two-part series, uh, or not a two-part series, a two-part sermon. Uh, we're, I don't know how many parts this series is going through Matthew, but something like 200. So, um, so as we continue through the book of Matthew, we, we, uh, we paused in, in the woe statements of Jesus. And Jesus says, woe, and that, that statement of woe is one of both condemnation uh, and conviction. It is, it is a statement to show shake them up a little bit and to to try to gather their attention so that they too might be saved. And so even as Jesus is beelining towards the towards the cross uh, in the Passion Week, the last week of his ministry here on earth before the crucifixion, Jesus is still trying to save people. What an amazing God that we serve, is he not? What an amazing amount of love that he has. And today we're going to see the outcome of this. We're going to see what happens when Jesus tries to to shake them up and how Jesus will continue to shake the world all the way until his return, still trying to gather the attention of those who have rejected him, of those who have hated him, of those who have absolutely spit in his face and he is still trying to save them. And so let me just say today, um, if they hated Jesus, should we not expect that they just love us like crazy? Isn't that the reality, though? Don't we expect everybody to love us? You know what? As a pastor, I'm just going to tell you, if somebody comes in and they're not happy when they leave, I take that as a personal, uh, like a personal failure. I I want everybody to come to know Jesus. I want everybody to come to know the Lord. I want them to receive the message and, and, and to respond to it. And so how do we deal with that when people don't like our God? How do we deal with that when they don't like our God so much that they hate you? Just before... Uh, I stepped up here. I, I silence my phone. I turn everything off. I, I, I try to make sure I don't have any distractions. And I saw my phone flash. And, um, and Anita grabbed it. And I said, don't touch it. Don't, I don't want to know what it is. And she started laughing. And I got an ad on my phone that flashed up on the top. And it said, it's time to kill some bad guys. <laughs> I was like, wow, as I get ready to go into the pulpit. Um, okay. And now I knew why he, why he showed that to me. Um, sometimes I think that that's the way that believers think. Sometimes we think that we just need to get them back, that we need to get even, that we can never let anybody get ahead of us. And even if that means that we have to take some of them out. But you know what? All that got us in the past is the Crusades. It wasn't a great time in history. That's not what God has in store for us. And today, as we continue on our sermon called The Endgame Avenger, we are going to see that we can trust in Jesus. We can trust in Jesus to do the right thing. We can trust in Jesus for eternity. And we can trust in Jesus to avenge us because he is the faithful one. We don't have to take it upon ourselves. And so let vengeance belong to the Lord. Let us pray. Father, as we open up your word now, I pray your special blessing upon it. This has been one of the hardest passages I've ever preached. And yet, Father, I see your church responding and loving and, and being encouraged to follow you and, and just come to know you better. And today, Father, we're going to learn a lot about what it means to be a disciple of yours and what it means to be like you, even in suffering sometimes. But Father, no matter where we're at, whether we have plenty, whether we have nothing, whether we are in tribulation or whether we are in absolute peace, whether our government persecutes us or blesses us, whether our neighbors love us or hate us, may we never cease of cease or tire of doing what is good and what is right by you. 
May we love you above all things, and may you bless the reading of your word this morning for the glory of your name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, would you open them up to Matthew 23, 29 is where we're going to start tonight. (coughs) Well, let's make it this morning. (laughs) It's it's, it's been a long week. Uh, I'm kind of with Tony. All right, it says... Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous, and you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we wouldn't have taken part of, uh, with them in shedding the prophets' blood. So you testify against yourselves that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your ancestors' sin. Wow. These just get progressively harder, don't they? <laughs> Just harder and harder. We've already seen the concept of the whitewashed tombs. uh, And now we continue by seeing what Jesus has to say about the tombs that they are decorating. Uh, It's interesting. Josephus, a Jewish Jewish historian, some of you who have even read him, uh, records that that, um, the king before Herod had taken 3,000 talents of silver, millions of dollars, out of King David's tomb. Uh, to kind of a relative term, and that there was so much more than that left behind. And so Herod wanted to cash in on this. And so Herod spent a lot of trying time trying to find the silver that was still left in King David's tomb. And so after he went around plundering and trying to plunder all of these different tombs, he eventually becomes convicted of this. And he repents and he spends a great deal of money building tombs to honor the dead. Now, the Jews did it, and they did it as well, but they did it for a different reason. They wanted to honor those that had come before them, all the while thinking that they were morally and spiritually better than their ancestors. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that something that maybe we could relate to in our country? You know, it used to be a time that the older that you got, the wiser you were, right? Is it still that way? Those of you who are older than me, do you feel totally honored by those younger than you? Uh, Resounding, yes, I'm pretty sure that's what you said. You know what? They have an elitist attitude that believes everyone before them were either stupid or not nearly, nearly as holy as they were. You know, good thing we as Americans would never do that. And so they sit in judgment of their ancestors, saying that if they had lived in those days, that they wouldn't have shed the blood of the prophets. And yet at the same time, they are making monuments to those failed leaders, and they themselves are plotting to kill Jesus. Isn't that ironic? We wouldn't shed the, 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 uh, the blood of the prophets. Now, come on, let's figure out a plan so that we can crucify him, so that we can kill him, so that we can dismantle this man. Now, they may not be sons, literally, as they're called sons here, uh, of those who did it, but they surely are in the line of those who did it. They're just like those who had begun before them. And it continues, fill up then the measure of your ancestors' sins. And that, to me, as I read it, was a scary, scary statement. Do we have to answer for the sins of our ancestors? Do we have to answer for the sins of others? Now, I know that sins of others do affect us, right? Somebody can, can get drunk and they can get in a car and they can ram you whether you're doing anything wrong or not. We pay for the wrongdoings of other people. We see that happen all the time. But do we have to pay for the, the sins of our fathers? We know that the Old Testament speaks of God's faithfulness to a thousand generations and he punishes sin to the second and third generation or the third and fourth generation. And so is this true? Do I have to pay for the sins of my grandpa? And the answer is no. Deuteronomy 24, 2 Kings 14, Ezekiel 18, Jeremiah 31 all say that that is not true. The idea isn't that God makes us pay for the sins of others, but that our sins are hounded down to our children and our children's children. That if we do something wrong, that we teach that to our children. And we now know that genetically, that some of those sins are carried on even genetically. Things like alcoholism and drug abuse are passed down to three or four generations. 
And so when we sin, we pass on a legacy of sin. So this verse means something different. Verse 31, Jesus is telling them that they are following in the footsteps of their spiritual fathers. In verse 32 then, it is a euphemism uh, of, uh, for judgment. How many of you have had moms that are about up to here with your nonsense? And how many of you have ever just about had enough? Or I've had enough of you, uh, uh, that kind of thing. We get that, right? God has about had enough of them. He's about had enough of them. And what they're about to do is going to push him over the edge. In fact, that's exactly what the end of this chapter says. The verses that we're not going to specifically read, but I'm going to reference today. Uh, uh, Jerusalem is full up in sin. And it's all coming down on them. We see this concept illustrated in Genesis. Genesis 15, 16. In the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. You see that? It's that same concept. No, this many sins, but this many pushes him over the edge. That's, That's the same concept here. God hadn't quite had enough of them, but it was about to happen. And unfortunately, instead of turning from their sins, which is what Jesus is calling them to do, they they respond in the most horrible of ways. And Jesus predicts it and prophesies what is about to happen. And of course, he is exactly right. Starting in verse 33, then it says, Snakes, brood of vipers, how can you escape being condemned to hell? This is why I am sending you prophets, sages, and scribes. Some of you, them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. So all the righteous blood shed on earth will be charged to you, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all these things will come on this generation. The last subpoint then is that uh, woe to those who kill and persecute the prophets and teachers of God. You know, there's, there's a lot here. There, there's a lot in this passage, a, a whole lot in this passage. So working backwards just a little bit, their guilt is just like their ancestors. They are going to kill, crucify, flog, pursue the prophets, sages, which are basically wise men, scribes, teachers of God. And in doing so, they are going to be held accountable. Therefore, in verse 33, Jesus asks them how they, can, how they can escape being condemned to hell. So let's process that just a little bit. They're evil, just like their forefathers. But Jesus is doing something about it. And, and this is one of the most significant points, I think. Jesus is sending teachers and prophets, people like us, to people like them. Now, Jesus knows how they're going to react, doesn't he? Which means that Jesus knows that some of his followers are going to die and others are going to suffer. Jesus knows that some of us will flee for our lives and others will be beaten and imprisoned. This isn't the plan for those of uh, those that have rejected. These are, this is the plan for those of us that are his. You know, When God said, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for your good, that's not what I had in mind. Is it what you had in mind for your Christianity? That sometimes we would flee, sometimes we would run for our life, sometimes we would have to uh, be tortured, beaten, imprisoned, or killed? That's a hard truth. When Jesus talks about picking up your cross or how we will not be treated better or loved more than he was, I generally think that we as a people believe that he's speaking metaphorically or or using hyperbole. He's exaggerating. In fact, in modern day Christianity, we can hear the statements of the saints fairly often saying stuff like, "I, I don't think that God's going to allow us to suffer. He would never do that to us. How many of you have heard somebody say that? I I bet everybody, and in fact, I'm willing to bet that half of us have said something along those lines. The church is exempt or or will be removed from serious trials or tribulation, but, but that isn't what we see here, is it? 
That is not the promise nor the prophecy of Jesus Christ. Not only that, but there are 2,000 years of Christian martyrs that would like to disagree with our belief. And another couple of thousand years before that of people who don't seem to have been exempt from trials and tribulation. God didn't remove the Israelites from the plagues of Egypt, but he saved them from them. God didn't take Daniel out of the lion's den, did he? But he never left him. Jonah made it through the whale. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived in the furnace. They weren't taken out of the furnace. Even Esther didn't have her situation changed, but God saved her and all of the Israelites through her. God purifies through fire, and He is glorified in our faithfulness. Think about it. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fire, wasn't it the king that would say, and there's one in there that looks like the son of the gods? And, and when Daniel is in the, the, the lion's den, doesn't, doesn't uh, um, Darius, right? Uh, speak out and say, I have to look to my wife to make sure I'm right. Uh, so don't, didn't Darius say, um, you know, has your God been able to save you? And don't we see that over and over and over? Even in the plagues of Egypt, as all of those things happen, don't, don't we see that there is an acknowledgement of God there, that the God of the Israelites has saved them? God is glorified in our faithfulness, and he's even glorified in our trials. And many of you probably are familiar with the magazine Christianity Today. And in a previous issue, they claim that there has been approximately 70 million Christians since the year, since, since Jesus' death that have died, that have been martyred for their faith. 70 million. The estimates are that in the last 10 years or so, um, that a million Christians, almost 100,000 a year, have died for their faith. Uh, according to Open Door Ministry, if you, um, if you look at the places where Christians are under severe persecution because of their faith. There are 245 million Christians right now living under intense persecution. 4,305 4, Christians were killed for no other reason than their belief in Jesus Christ. And that doesn't include any of the holy wars or the religious wars or cleansings that are going on, which account for another 100,000 or so. 1,847 churches and Christian buildings were attacked. 3,150 Christians were detained without a trial, arrested, sent, or, or uh, imprisoned for their faith. You know, I hate to break it to us and to you, but this is not our world. This is not our Father's house, but it is part of God's plan. God really does want everyone to be saved. And if you ever feel unloved, remember this, God will spare no expense, not even at the cost of his only son, so that you may have the opportunity to be saved. And if you face persecution, remember that the same God who opened heaven so that Stephen may, may be welcomed and not be alone in his stoning is the same God who fills you with his Holy Spirit today. God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And our eternity is absolutely secure in him. The second point, <laughs> I just love that. After two sermons, we got to the second point. God's end game demonstrates him as the avenger. And so the first sub point then is that God's love works to redeem even those who kill and torture. And so we've read these verses before, but let's read verse 34 again. This is why I am sending you prophets, sages, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will flog in the synagogues and pursue from town to town. Jesus is sending prophets, wise men, teachers. Why? Why is Jesus sending them? Because of verse 33, because Jesus doesn't want them to go to hell. It is really that simple. We've covered this a little bit, but humor me for just a moment, please. God, um, we speak of God wanting all men and women to be saved, but we don't often think of what that actually means or the price that we might have to pay in order for someone to be saved. Do you realize today that God wants the terrorists to be saved? 
That God wants those who are not like you to be saved. That God wants those who are cult leaders, the legalist, the Muslim, the Jew, the rich, the poor, the homeless, the hopeless, the sinner and the so-called saint. He wants all of them to be saved as well. Do you realize that God wants the child molester to be saved? God wants the serial killer to be saved. And the truth is, is that God wants you to be saved from sin and its consequences as well. God wants everyone to be saved, even if that means that you may have to suffer for a little while to make it possible. Even if that means that we need to suffer for a little while to make that possible. You know, this isn't normally something that we speak about. I don't think I've ever had a pastor stand in the pulpit and tell me um, that, that Jesus is sending me to suffer. We read the verses about God sending us out like, like lambs among the wolves. But I don't think we really take that to the conclusion of where it, where it ends. Just because we don't often speak of it doesn't mean that it isn't true. But remember, please remember, no one suffered more than Jesus. He died for you when you were his enemy as well. And so we get to our last point. And, and lastly, let's let God be the avenger. We just need to be faithful to make it to the end. And so our last point then is that God's love avenges the blood of his prophets. And so this wraps up kind of the woe statements of Jesus. If they fail to receive him as Lord and Savior, then they will indeed pay for their sins. And there's a great theological truth here. Either you let Jesus pay the price for your sins or you pay for it yourself. That's it. There's only two options. Um, you know, do you have to let Jesus pay that price? No, you, you can stand on your own two feet at the, at, at, at the judgment seat, or you'll stand for a second until you bow. Um, but, but everyone will answer for their sins, and it is a price that we don't want to pay. And so those are the options. In verse 34, we discussed how they will treat God's people. In verse 35, though, we see that God is going to hold them accountable. From the first death until the most recent, they are going to stand on their own for what they've done. God has had it up to here. He has had enough. And if you look at the following verses, you'll see a statement against Jerusalem as well. They will not be able to see Jesus again until his return. In AD 70, Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple obliterated, and they became, uh, uh, they ceased to exist as a nation. God will make things right. He punishes those who did his people wrong in the Old Testament, and he will continue to right the wrongs when he returns again. So until then, what do we do? Well, until then, we have to remember that Jesus is coming back to get us. We have to hold firm to the faith that we have in him. We have to believe that he cares for us, that he will defend us, that he will provide for us, that he will take us to be with him forever, and that we don't live ultimately for this world. And so we look forward to those days. And so we, we go back to those that have suffered in the past. We go back and we look at David uh, and, and Daniel, and we go back and we look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we see the prophets and those that have run for their life and those that have fleed from town to town. And we see people like Paul, and we see that through their persecution that a multitude of people were saved and influenced, and that we are still hearing of their faithfulness all of these years, thousands and thousands of years later. And so the challenge for us is to be faithful so that some might be saved. To be faithful so that God would use us as a testimony of what is yet to come. So that God would use us to show the world who he is, how much he loves us, and, and what, what he desires for them. That they could be forgiven. And so we need to look at the world differently. We need to look at persecution differently. We need to, to be like the apostles that ran out of the, out of the, uh, the trial, uh, you know, rejoicing that they got to suffer for the name. We need to do like Jesus uh, told us to do. And we need to rejoice when we are counted worthy to suffer for the name. 
And we need to take ourselves out of the position of the avenger and we need to let God do it. We need to be the suffering servant. We need to be the followers of Jesus Christ. We need to be the ones that are faithful no matter what happens to us in this world because who do we fear? What can man do to us? We are secure eternally in Jesus Christ. And so start with the easy stuff. Start with the small offenses and give them to Jesus. Take it to the big offenses and take it to the active persecution and take it to everything and lift your heart to Jesus and let him um, be your defender. Let him be the one that works through all of these things to do something amazing in your life and to do something amazing in someone else's life. God never told us that following him would be easy, but he absolutely promised us that he'll never leave us. Hold on to that truth. Cling to the cross. Cling to Jesus. And let's pray that someone would see our faithful love, our faithful witness, and that they too might be saved. Let us pray. Lord, as we come before you now, we want nothing more than to be faithful servants, walking in your footsteps, obedient even unto the point of death. And Father, that is not something that most of us face right now, but it is always something that we could face. And so, Father, today I just pray that you would help us to love you, help us to trust in you, help us um, never to take our eyes off of you. Help us not to try to defend ourselves. And even in the little offenses, like how we drive and how others drive and how we react and how we're dealt with in business situations. Help us to stand for what is right, but help us to do it to bring glory to your name instead of our own. May it be so in Jesus name. Amen.